Hello, this is James Gully. I'm a senior investigator in the intramural program at the NIH, and we're talking about ethics in the conduct of research, part two, fabrication and falsification. And we're going to be sharing some stories of fabrication and falsification as an example of what not to do. First case we're going to discuss is an infamous case in 2006 that involved the Korean investigator Wu Suk Hwang, who claimed to have created the first ever human embryonic stem cell lines whose DNA matched that of patients, promising great breakthroughs for diseases. This case involved questionable data management. Nine of 11 cell lines were fabricated, the images were manipulated, and we'll talk about each of this. One of the results is that major journals are changing the review process to incorporate analysis of images that are submitted for publication. We're, we'll talk about the images that were uh, submitted. So this in the uh, top here, you're seeing the original images that were submitted to the journal Science. And down below, you're seeing the adjusted tonal range of those same images. This was in the supplemental section of the science paper. And what you can see is when you adjust the tonal range, you can see that those two middle uh, figures are actually identical. And this um, was shown to be scientific misconduct. When they went back and looked at other figures, there was image manipulation in many of them. Here's another example of, of image manipulation, and this was something that was uh, just published in a paper showing how one could potentially manipulate images and one how, how one could capture that. So you can see this top image looks fine with these different cells. However, when you go in and you adjust the contrast, you can see areas where there was um, the black around these areas of yellow cells where there was clearly cutting and pasting going on. Here's another case where a scientist had scientific misconduct. This was a paper that was published in Nature, and within days of the publication, it was shown that the images were altered, that text was plagiarized, and that there was fabrication also. This scientist suggested that we could make stem cells just by putting blood cells in a weak citric acid and it would make embryonic stem cells. And this was just a, uh, um, an overview of what happened with this story that was published in The Guardian. Here's another example of scientific misconduct. And this was a breast cancer prevention trial. There was a data coordinator who falsified and fabricated dates of the test and exams just because they needed to fill out a, uh, a sheet and they couldn't find the right dates, so they just made them up. Another one where a, another cooperative group, NIH cooperative group, a data coordinator falsified and fabricated follow-up data from patients. These are all cases that came to light and were sent to the NIH for review. So why does this matter? If you get inaccurate information regarding patient status and date of death or date of progressive disease, this could result in an over or underestimate of treatment benefits, especially when the length of survival and length of disease-free survival are the endpoints of the study. Here is another example of research misconduct that is quite troubling. In the late 1980s, it became increasingly evident that there may be activity with high doses of chemotherapy for breast cancer, including hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And this was quite popular to do in the late, late 80s and, and early 90s. And there were a number of studies that, that were done in breast cancer for this, including five randomized studies. Now, what became interesting is that four of these studies were completely negative, and there was one study that was strikingly positive, having a complete response rate of 51% versus 4% for those patients that didn't get the 
uh, stem cell transplant. And this was published by Dr. Brezwoda in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 1995. And here's the paper saying that high-dose chemotherapy with uh, hematopoietic rescue as a primary treatment for metastatic cancer, this randomized study, and stated that this was a positive study. Well, later there was a review of the data in Lancet on, on sorry, in Lancet, that they went back and they actually audited the data since they saw what was the difference between this study that had was strikingly positive and the four negative studies. So they actually went to South Africa and they looked at the data that Dr. Bezwoda had um, put forth. And what they found was that there were 154 patients. They were only able to find records available for 58 of those patients. And 38 of these 58 patients were ineligible per the protocol that they were given. When they further looked into the protocol, they found that there was no IRB approval for the protocol. And also different from what was reported in the uh, paper, while they found that uh, there was only 7% of the patients were white compared with what was reported, which was 37% of the patients were white. And these were also, these patients were largely from poor neighborhoods. So there were multiple inconsistencies and, uh, with the data, and there was also a lack of regulatory approval. Eventually, this led to the retraction of this uh, highly cited paper in the Journal of Clinical Oncology the next year. So why does this matter? Well, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is very costly, both in terms of monetary amounts and side effects. Treatment-related mortality for hematopoietic stem cell transplant at the time was quite high, between 10 and 20 percent. Next, let's switch to another story um, that s shows scientific misconduct. This is a story that was highlighted in the late 1990s. There was a paper published in the journal Lancet by Wakefield, Dr. Wakefield, that linked the mumps, measles, and rubella vaccine to this syndrome of autism and diarrhea. It was based on 12 patients, but multiple groups went in and they could not replicate the findings of Dr. Wakefield. And a reporter actually uncovered the story and took this to the British Medical Journal and published this in 2011. And he uncovered multiple inconsistencies. Some of the things he uncovered were the fact that um, whereas Dr. Wakefield had said that these patients largely had regressive autism, and in the Lancet paper had published that 9 out of 12 of these patients had this regressive autism, the records really only indicated that perhaps 6 out of the 12 patients had regressive autism, and it was unclear if any of them had regressive autism. In addition, there was nonspecific colitis mentioned in the Lancet article in 11 out of the 12 patients, but in the... Um, review of the patient's charts and discussions with the patients by uh, this reporter, only three out of the 12 patients had nonspecific colitis. And finally, when they looked at when did these symptoms occur, did they occur before or after the vaccination, two of the patients that had the nonspecific colitis had the symptoms that occurred before getting the vaccine. And the thir third one, it was unclear uh, when that began. So for all of these features, the Lancet on, uh, article claimed that 12, six out of the 12 patients had these features. And when they w looked into the records, none of the patients had these features, completely debunking the issue of the MMR vaccine causing this regressive autism colitis syndrome. 
It, unfortunately, Wakefield had failed to disclose that he was working on a lawsuit against the manufacturer of the MMR max vaccine and was paid over 435,000 pounds. Wakefield was stripped of his medical license and the Lancet paper was retracted in 2010. What has the, been the implications of this? Well, we've seen a significant decrease in the proportion of uh, children inoculated against the MMR shown in the bottom graph here. And this has led to also an increase in the number of cases of confirmed measles. This is data from England and Wales. And here is data uh, in the United States. You can see that the number of cases actually um, was quite high in 2014. And there was a, a, also a record number of outbreaks. But that um, by 2019, you can also see that as of April of 2019, there it looked like there was a record number of cases again. And um, measles is the, a, a type of disease that is easily preventable with a vaccine and causes widespread rashes and, and even fatalities, uh, especially in, in young children that get this. And unfortunately, uh, this uh, decrease in the herd immunity, once you get to less than 90% of the patients or less than 85% of the patients having vac being vaccinated, rather, you can have substantial outbreaks that, that are difficult to control. So in summary, we've discussed image manipulation, which is falsification of images, and also making up or fabrications of outcome data. And this was often done for sake of expediency or uh, for sake of trying to improve one's stature in the scientific community. So these are the questions for part two. Which best describes falsification? Is it removing of a data point to make a graph look better? Putting on the best guess at what data should be if you don't have the exact information or using somebody else's data or idea without giving credit? And the correct answer is number one, removing a data point to make a graph look better. How about which describes fa fabrication best? Removing a data point, putting in the best guess at what the data should be if you don't have the exact information, or using somebody else's idea without giving credit. And the correct answer here is number two. So what we've tried to share with you in this section is a little bit about fabrication and falsification, and we want to leave you with the understanding that science is about getting to truth. Thank you for listening today.